Today on Experience Him with Tracy Harris. The force of faith works like a seed. Now what do you have to do with seed to get any fruit out of it? You've got to plant it. And when you believe it, and when you act on it, there is a miracle of sudden change. And it's as real and as powerful as the moment you got born again. And now join us for today's message, Faith for Change. Saints, tonight I want to minister to you under the direction of the Holy Spirit about faith for change. Did you know that your life doesn't have to stay the same? That there is nothing in your world that cannot change because of the power that is operating on the inside of you. Did you know that things that you see are temporary? And every unseen thing is eternal, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want to read you a scripture from the book of Romans, chapter 12. And as I begin to read this, it'll be a familiar scripture to each of you, but we're going to focus on something the Spirit of God has to say concerning his law that governs supernatural change in our lives. In other words, intervention in Jesus' name. Listen to what he says. He says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. One translation says, do not be squeezed into this world's mold. In other words, don't let the world shape and fashion you to the image that it thinks you ought to look like. There's pressure from the outside pressing in. You know, when I was a young man, it always intrigued me because I was fascinated by, and I'm going to date myself now, but Lloyd Bridges and deep sea diving and all of that and, uh, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea. They'd get down in those rooms in the bottom of a submarine and they'd be way down underwater and they'd put on their scuba gear and they'd open this door, whoop, and they jump out in the water. Next thing you know, they're down in the ocean, you know. And I'm wondering, how can they open that door in the water and not fill up the submarine? I mean, this is ridiculous. And it was before I learned about the law of pressure. And I didn't realize that all it did was equalize the pressure. That the pressure of the water is greater on the outside than the pressure inside the hull of a boat or anything else. You know, a submarine is actually built in such a way that they're rated to go maybe a certain you know, 1,000 feet or however, however deep they're ready to go. And it all has to do with the fact that the deeper you go, the greater the pressure is. Well, that hull has been created to withstand the pressure pressing in from the outside, right? Now, you strengthen the wall of that submarine by pumping pressure in from the inside. You, you can equalize that pressure. And when you equalize the pressure, whatever is on the inside, you understand, whatever's on the inside will keep whatever's outside trying to come in on the outside. And so I, I, I thought this is just the neatest thing. So I, once I learned that, I'd take an old number three wash tub, you know, and jump in the swimming pool, and I'd go down under and I'd try to pull that thing down over my head. It was amazing, amazing, because there's an air pocket under there. Why? Because the water can't come up in that tub. Because the air that's inside that tub won't allow that water to come up in there. And so you can go completely underwater and you can still breathe. Why? There's an air pocket. You're completely underwater. Water's on top of you. Water's around you. Water's underneath you. There's no water in that tub where your head is. And you can breathe that air. Why? Because the pressure gets equalized and the pressure of the air 
that's on the inside of that tub keeps the rest of that outside. Now, here's my point. My point is, is the world has a pressure. And that pressure was released on the earth by a law that the first man and woman set in motion when they disobeyed God. It's called the law of sin and death. The Bible says that God cannot be tempted with evil. All right? Neither can he tempt, does he tempt any man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It goes on to say, but when lust is conceived, that means evidently sin is offered to every person as a seed in seed form. When they meditate on it, when they allow it on the inside of themselves, like all seeds do, if it gets down in the soil of your heart, it'll germinate and it'll grow to the point to where it manifests in action. First the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn in the ear. So every law operates in the law of the kingdom, which governs everything in the kingdom. Jesus taught this principle in what's called the great parable of the sower. In fact, he told the disciples, unto you it is given to understand the things of the kingdom of heaven. He said it in Luke 8. He said it in Matthew 13. He said it in Mark chapter 4. One of the things that he said each time he told that parable was simply this. Do you not understand this parable? How are you going to understand all parables? Evidently, if they were given revelation to understand the kingdom, and the kingdom was completely revealed in the parable of the sower, to understand that parable gives us access to understand how the entire kingdom works, then the scripture is telling us that the kingdom is completely, everything in the kingdom is moved and transferred by the law of seed time and harvest. Now we know that because when Adam was created in the image of God, he was given dominion. When he was given dominion, he was also given seed. And when that seed was given to him, that seed became an implement of his dominion. Man was the only species of being that God created that could operate this law. The birds didn't sow or reap, build barns or gather into them. They were fed. Their need was met. But that's different than taking dominion over your future and creating a future. Understand that a harvest, too many people get confused about the harvest, seed time and harvest. And one of the things they're confused about is they're sitting around waiting on God to give them a harvest when they don't understand we are as responsible to harvest as we are to sow. And our seed has dominion. Once it goes in the ground, I'm telling you, you can put an old chrysoprase pole in the ground and it'll eventually rot even though it's treated to last a long time. Eventually that wood's going to rot. And the reason is that soil is going to attack that thing, try to grow it. This world was designed to grow everything that's put into it. And you were created out of the dust of the ground. You were created in God's image. Your spirit man was actually created as the engine. That's the soil. The human heart's the soil. It was created as the engine that whatever you put into it, it grows it. It's like the unexposed film in the camera. Whatever your eyes look at, it'll, it'll snatch a picture of that and assume that because you've meditated on it, because you've looked at it, because you've listened to it, you want it. So your spirit will start going after it. You don't realize it, but you're setting, it's like putting a car out of neutral into gear. You're actually setting something in motion. Now, maybe I'm a little bit ahead of myself, but the book of James chapter 3 talks about how that happens. Now, we understand that words are seeds. We get that from the very book of Genesis. Jesus said in the parable of the sower, the sower sows the word. That tells me right there the word is seed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says we're born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of the living God, which lives and abides forever. Well, there you go. God's word is seed. And in the Word of God, in the DNA of, of the seed, is everything God is. So we see that when you plant a seed, every seed reproduces after its own kind. So the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. So if you meditate on healing scriptures, 1 Peter 2.24, by His stripes you are healed, that's healing seed. And 1 Peter 2, 24, when planted in your spirit often enough, can become a new liver. 
when planted in your heart often enough can become a new heart. When planted in your, in your spirit often enough can become a new eyeball. It can become new veins or a new blood cell. It, glory to God. It can become new nerve. Why? Because the word becomes flesh. He said in Proverbs 4, My son, attend to my words. Climb your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life. They are life. What is it? My words. My words are life to those that find them. They are health to all their flesh. Now, the word health is the Hebrew word for medicine. God's word is the seed of medicine to all my flesh. So guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the springs. Issues means forces, springs. The river of life flows out of the human heart. And what supplies your heart is what your eyes see and what your ears hear. So Jesus said, take heed what you hear. Now, he taught the kingdom parable of the parable of the sower, and here's what he said. He said, if you don't understand this parable, <clears throat> how are you going to understand any parable? Evidently, every other parable is to be understood. All parables, everything Jesus taught is to be understood by revelation through the filter of the law of seed, time, and harvest. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed, time, and harvest. Right? Winter and summer, cold and heat, it won't cease. So we need to understand that God created not just this planet, but the entire kingdom to operate as a seed time and harvest. Now, let me just say one more thing about this. Most people don't know this, <clears throat> but Jesus said about himself in John 12, if I remain, in other words, I don't, if I don't go to the cross and die, he said, I'll be like a kernel of wheat. In other words, I will abide alone. But if I fall into the ground and die, I will bring forth much fruit. Now think about the way Jesus is teaching here. He said, my father's the husbandman. I'm the vine, you're the branches. The husbandman is the owner of the vineyard. He plants what he wants to grow. He decides what's planted in the vineyard. Jesus said, I'm the vine. So the husbandman, God, planted Jesus. Why? Because he want, that's what he wanted. <clears throat> So the Bible says we were buried together with him in baptism. And the scripture uses in Romans 6, this verse, planted together in the likeness of his death. Jesus was God's greatest seed. How do you think he got the kingdom into the world? He moved the whole kingdom by planting the seed that would produce it. The entire kingdom operates by the law of seed time and harvest. And we in God's image are the only class of being anything he ever created that can dominate our future on purpose based on the seed we sow. Birds don't sow seeds. Dogs don't sow seeds. Gorillas and lions don't sow seeds. They eat what grows of its own accord. Their need is met. But they cannot increase their future by the decision of what seed they plant. Only mankind can dominate his tomorrow by the seed he plants today. Seed is what God has given man to change his world, to change his future, to change his outcome, to change what the ground will produce. Now the reason that is so important, the whole reason that I went down that line of sharing with you till we can get back over here is because Jesus said, if you had faith, Matthew 17, verse 20, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, he didn't say as small as a grain of mustard seed. He's not talking about the amount. He's talking about his comparison, how it works. Seed is how faith works. What he's saying is the force of faith works like a seed. Come on now. The force of faith works like a seed. Now what do you have to do with seed to get any fruit out of it? You've got to plant it. So Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say. So he's told us faith works like a seed. And the way you plant the seed of faith is to say something. Well, we know that's got to be true because Jesus said the sower sows the word. 
that were born again. Now, let me ask you a question. Born again. Born again. Would you say <clears throat> that born again means a sudden, miraculous, eternal, supernatural change happened in your life? Yes. Would you agree with that? All right, if that's true, when you were born again, what happened? A miracle of sudden change, and it changed forever your eternal destiny. What produced that? By grace are you saved through faith. Faith produced the action of the power of God to create a sudden change. In a moment, you were translated from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of God's Dear son, or the son of his love, Colossians 1.12. So that tells me that the very first time my faith was used, it changed my destiny from hell to heaven. From curse to blessing. From sickness to health. From death to life. From darkness to light. What changed it suddenly? My faith. The seed I planted. I didn't want beans, so I planted corn. I didn't want cotton, so I planted soybean. I don't want the curse. So I'm going to use my faith to change the curse into a blessing. Whoa, glory to God. Are you getting this? Somebody say, faith, faith. for change. All right, glory to God. Now listen, here's what the Lord wants to me. Let's go back and read this in the light of what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in Romans 12, 1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not squeezed from the outside, pressed into the image of the world's idea of doing things, of the world's mold, but be transformed. The word transformed here is the word in the Greek metamorphosis. It's the same word that we find two other places in the word, Matthew 17, where Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and there his countenance was altered, changed before their eyes. This word is also used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. He says in verse 17, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. By the time you get to verse 18, he says, We all with open face... Now hear me, this is the key to all change. Open face. Now, this particular session, I don't have time to get into that particular law that governs this, but it is so important that you at least understand a tidbit of it. Because Moses saw the glory of God, and that glory dissipated under the old covenant, and the covenant we're under, a new covenant, has a glory that will never fade away. So by the time you read 2 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Now when anyone shall turn to the Lord, that veil will be taken away. When you turn to Jesus, the veil of the lack of the ability to see into what you're supposed to look like is gone. You're no longer veiled. The world doesn't have the power. See, the light, which is the word, shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. So therefore, the world doesn't have the authority to stop the light from shining. If you'll get in this word, the world doesn't have the power to squeeze you into its mold. You will be transfigured, changed, altered by the renewing of your mind because the light will dawn on your heart. And here's what will happen. On the inside of you, you'll begin to take on the shape. Your life will begin to look like the word and not the world. Now, the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, of course it does because the word's like a bucket. It's a seed. You know, an acorn, inside an acorn is the bark, the roots, the sap, the limbs, the leaves, other acorns. The whole oak tree's in that acorn. I'm telling you, all of everything the kingdom is and God is, is in the seed of this word. It has the power to produce its own self. You get this down in your heart, and it is a guaranteed incorruptible harvest that hell has no power and no weapon to stop the change that will take place. 
When you hear and receive this word, it grows. The blade, the ear, the full corn in the ear. And when you believe it, and when you act on it, there is a miracle of sudden change. And it's as real and as powerful as the moment you got born again. Now the Bible tells us that we can be transformed, transfigured, altered, renewed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. The word measures in the Greek is metron, capacity, adequate length, due portion. What he's saying is, is that we don't all have, the Bible talks about little faith, no faith, great faith, faith that grows exceedingly. So how could you say every man has the same measure of faith? He doesn't. But God has dealt to every man the same capacity. Why? Because you're created in the image of God. Your spirit man is the faith engine. This seed will work in the soil of your spirit the same way this seed will work in the soil of any man that will ever hear it. God has dealt to every man the capacity to have faith that will change their life from the world into the will of God. God, you can prove out the will of God for your life by the capacity of the faith that's inside your spirit. If you'll hear the word, believe it ought to look different, and exercise your faith, you can have a miracle of sudden change. I'm telling you, that's exactly how Jesus' ministry started. The very first miracle he ever, he ever, ever worked was in a wedding at Cana of Galilee, John 2.11 says, this beginning of miracles, Jesus did at Cana of Galilee, manifested forth his glory, and you know the miracle. They ran out of wine. He said, fill up the water pots. Carry them to the governor of the feast. While they acted on the word, there was a miracle of sudden change. It was different when they got there than it was when they started. Today, I'm telling you, have faith for change. This day's your day. There are miracles of sudden change in the house. And he's going to restore the years the canker worm, the pommel worm, the locust, and the caterpillar is eaten. I'm telling you with open face, we can behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And the Bible says we are changed into that self-same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We have help. The Spirit of God who removes every burden and destroys every yoke is with us, for us, and in us. He's operating through us, and greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And he said, don't be conformed to this world. With an open face, see what you're supposed to look like from the Word. Use your faith and begin to call your life what the Word calls it. I'm healed. I'm changed. I'm free. I'm delivered. I'm whole. My family's whole. I'm prosperous. I'm blessed. And if you'll call those things to be not as though they were, the same seed of faith in you will do for you what it's done for anyone, anywhere, ever. It'll be changed from dark to light, the power of Satan to the power of God, from hell to heaven, from sickness to health, from curse to blessing, and you can have a miracle of sudden change in Jesus' name. Friend, I want to pay for you right now. It's time for your sudden change. It's time for your water to become wine. Do what he told you to do in Jesus' name. Sow that seed. Act by faith. Move that knee. Move that shoulder. Move that wrist. Look and see. Take off those glasses. I'm telling you, this Jesus is healing you, prospering you, blessing you, and delivering you. I'm telling you, save a seat for that unsaved husband at church. Do whatever you have to do to act like it's already done because it is. It is finished. The blood is paid for it. Call those things to be not as though they were. And watch Jesus of Nazareth work a miracle of sudden change in your life. In Jesus' name. It actually started back in mid-December. I'd been having symptoms in my body and I knew that something was going on. As I started becoming sicker and sicker and 
I could feel the life in my body just kind of start powering down. Then like four days, I was able to get in to see the doctor. In a matter of hours, I'd already been moved from the office to a, another facility. They did the uh, x-rays and um, by 4.30 that evening, the doctor had called me and my husband in and had given me the diagnosis. And, um, and he said across there and he said, Jerry, and he said, uh, you've got stage three advanced ovarian cancer. You could call it stage four, stage three advanced, whatever. It had already spread. And I knew from that moment on, every word that came out of my mouth was gonna set the stage for my miracle. So I called my pastor. I said, Pastor, I've got the results from the test. And I said, I, I need you to laugh with me right now. I didn't feel like laughing at the time, but I knew that what came out of my mouth was what the devil needed to hear, and it was ha, 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 ha. At the report that the doctor had just given me. So pastor joined with me. And I mean, we attacked that thing right then and there, and we set the stage for my miracle manifestation. When I came out from the surgery, uh, the doctor just happened to walk into the room and I said, well, what's the prognosis? And she said, well, she's one of those that's real matter of fact, tells you like it is. And she said, Sherry, she said, we, we didn't get all of it. And so she said, we sewed that up and we're just gonna let uh, the chemo take care of it. So I got the revelation that he did it 2000 years ago, that I received my healing just like a free gift, just like I did for my salvation. Um, when I got a hold of that, that it was done deal, it changed how I would fight uh, the battle from here on out. That very first Monday on March 19th, when I went in for the chemo, uh, I took the chemo, everything went great, and I called the nurse Tuesday, and I said, Buffy, I said, this is Sherry. I said, what was my CA-125 before chemo? And she said, 7.7. .7. And so I hung up and started doing the happy dance because here it was, 63, they sewed cancer up in me. And now before chemo ever started, it wasn't detected in my body. And I'd made a statement to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I said, chemo will not get the glory for this, but God will get the glory for this. And they did uh, uh, another CT and was able to you know, get the results. And the doctor said, you know, man, everything looks great. Life and death is in the tongue. And I speak life to you today. And I just want to encourage you that if he's done it for me, then he will do it for anybody. Thank you for watching Experience Him. If this message has ministered to you and you would like more information or to contact Harvest International Ministries, write to us at the address on the screen or please visit us online at tracyharris.tv. Join us as we go from vision to victory by helping this generation reach its destiny through teaching, preaching, and healing the nations.